In a landmark ruling, the government has moved to outlaw ownership of national newspapers and magazines by foreign governments. The Spectator and the Daily Telegraph, which had been up for sale, were due to be bought by Redbird, an investment fund backed by the Emirati government. Has press freedom been saved? Our editor, Fraser Nelson, joins me now. Fraser, thanks for joining Spectator TV. The sale of The Spectator and The Daily Telegraph has been a long, drawn-out process, and it's not over, but we've had some big updates this week. Can you talk us through them? The government has said it's going to outlaw the ownership of British national press, including magazines like The Spectator, by what they call foreign powers, in this case certainly the Emirati government. But it's going to expand the definition of foreign powers to, to take in organisations that effectively are government funded, even though they say they might not be. For example, um, IMI, that was the, um, the institution that was providing the money for The Spectator deal. The Redbird, their partner, had said, look, IMI isn't the Emirati government, this just happens to be owned by Sheikh Manzur, the Deputy Prime Minister of the Emirates, but he's acting in a private capacity. So the government's going to change the law to say, well, that's obviously a nonsense. We're going to define what a foreign interest is, so the foreign governments and the various proxies, and we're going to create a cordon sanitaire to make sure that they have no influence um, or ownership of newspapers and magazines. Pressure was put on the government through the Lords, which was going to put forward its own amendment to try to stop this sale, or not even stop it, ensure that there was some kind of parliamentary process, some kind of vote that would have to happen if uh, newspapers or periodicals were to be sold to foreign governments. But the government has now stepped in. I know you were watching that debate closely in the Lords. What were the highlights? Well, just to see Parliament working in the way that it's intended to, you get we're so used now to thinking of Parliament basically rubber stamping whatever the government wants, or there might be a rebellion to stop what the government wants. But this was an example of something else. The MPs and in both in the Commons and backbenchers and the Lords both agreed in the principle that foreign governments should not own the national newspapers, and that if there wasn't a law saying that, then there should be. So we, we then had a mechanism where Tina Stoll, a backbench peer, wanted to insert this law in the Digital Markets Bill. Now she had such support from backbenchers and the Lords, the Liberal Democrats, and, and a number of Tories, 150 Tories in the backbenchers and the Commons were willing to put it through. So this was Parliament, not the government, willing to write a law which the government itself was unwilling to do. Now the government was, was compromised in two ways. One is that it's seeking quite a lot of Emirati money itself, so the Emiratis have promised to invest in things like Sizewell C, not literally that, but other big infrastructure projects for which the government has pretty much given up on being able to fund by democratic methods and things it needs to get money from sovereign wealth funds, usually autocracies. So you've got the government itself as an institution hoping for more Emirati money and therefore having an invested interest in keeping the Emirati sweet and not vetoing them as part of the telegraph. The second way the government was compromised was that they had been caught up in the legalistic minutiae of their bid. They'd referred the spectator's bid to the competition authorities. There's no competition concerns. The Emirates don't own anything else in this country. But they didn't want to be seen to say a word which would in any way prejudge that. So you ended up with a situation where throughout this, the government has kept a, a vow of silence, hasn't said at all what it thinks about this. And meanwhile, time was passing, the Emirates looked more and more likely to get it. But it was Parliament and the institutions of Parliament, uh, Amendment in the Lords, a threatened rebellion in the Commons, that made clear to the government that unless it passed a law saying that foreign governments shouldn't be allowed to buy newspapers, then Parliament itself would pass the law. And I think there's something almost quite moving about that, because the free press, in my view, is part of our democratic apparatus, as is Parliament. And Parliament, as an institution, moved to protect the free press as an institution. So the institutions of our democracy were, in this case, able to look after each other and protect each other, no matter what the government, in this case the compromised government, thought. I suspect our viewers can sense the hint of enthusiasm behind your comments, Fraser. I know you're happy about these updates. I'm very happy. I'm also used to things just not working out. When you think of everything that's been going wrong and the institutions not working in the way that they have, it's almost amazing to see that Parliament has worked in the way it was intended. That the funny thing about our democratic institutions is that the House of Lords, some people think it should be abolished entirely, but it's worked. So these are institutions that work in practice, but don't work in theory. So I was, to be honest, I had expected some kind of compromise. So let's see, for example, if we can say to the Emirati government, look, we'll let you take a 20% stake and we'll keep your influence that way. 
But no, it seems as if they're going to make sure there's no Emirati government influence at all, not even a 1% stake. So I'm surprised. But there's also something else which I really didn't expect, and that was the intervention of the Labour Party. Now, for the last 10 years, I have portrayed the Labour Party as being an enemy of free press, pro-regulation. Keir Starmer came into politics through the hacking investigation and the hacked off strand of political activism. But it was Thangam Debonair, the Shadow Culture Secretary, who was a frontbencher who most emphatically said that a free press is defined by lack of government interference and that she was the one who said that a Labour government would make sure this deal would not pass. So you got the clearest, most principled opposition from a Labour frontbencher. That challenged my preconceptions about the Labour Party, I have to say. So it was surprising. It was, um, and in a way, you know, I still can't quite believe it's true, even um, a couple of days after this all happened. But it does seem as if Parliament and the Labour Party have successfully acted to protect press freedom at a time when the Tory government was equivocating. This sets a big precedent. This isn't just about the Daily Telegraph and The Spectator. No, because there's an overall trend here of autocracies trying to buy the infrastructure of democracies. They all invest in the same thing, like Heathrow Airport, the Dogger Bank, Wind Farm. Um, so they're trying to buy in infrastructure in a way that will compromise democracies. So it's harder for the British or the French or the German government to start to pick fights with the Emirates, given that they're after so much Emirati money. Now, this overall trend has got national security implications. Ten years ago, the Emirates were seem to be our allies, but now they're also Putin's allies. Now they're giving him 21 gun salute, and they're able to do so without any kind of kickback from the West, because the West, to a greater or lesser extent, are after the Emirati money. So this is a trend of seeking to buy influence, to buy soft power in democracies, and it works. We're not we're able to buy it via the, the contracts for the infrastructure. They're also able to buy people like George Osborne, for example. He was a former chancellor hired to represent the Emirates in this deal. When you look around, we saw Nadim Zahawi, a former chancellor. He was working for the Emirates and putting together the deal in the first place. And David Cameron, former prime minister, also was working for the Emirates by doing a lecturing stint at a university in Abu Dhabi um, last year. So this relatively small country is still managed to find on its books in one way or another two former Tory chancellors and one former Tory prime minister. Now this is quite new to British politics. It's a significant trend and it's one that I think Parliament needs to look at more broadly because we've seen in this drama the apparatus that the tools of influence of autocracies are using in our democracy. And I think that Parliament has shown how democracies can defend themselves. I hope the government now will follow suit. What should we expect to see now, Fraser? Because we don't have the full details of what the government's going to put forward. Something like co-ownership with a foreign government hasn't been ruled out yet. What are you expecting to see? We're going to get the third reading of this bill at the end of the month. Uh, now, what the government wants to do, understandably, is make sure it doesn't pass a law saying, for example, that the Canadian Teachers Pension Fund um, isn't kicked out of any investments they might have. Mm. There's a big difference between that and the Emirati government. So they, they don't want to pass a rule saying that any kind of foreign government link is bad because there's an obvious difference. But how do you legislate for that difference? How do you manage to identify the dictatorships seeking influence and separate them from the pension funds of the Norwegians, of the Canadians, etc., the other sovereign wealth funds? In other words, how do you distinguish an influence-seeking sovereign wealth fund with one which is genuinely just interested in investments. So that's the dilemma they're going to have over the next few days. But I'm led to believe by everybody I've spoken to in Parliament that the government is quite sincere about this. They're not going to fudge it. They're not going to allow the free press to be even part owned by dictatorships. Uh, so let's hope they do. And Fraser, what does this mean for the sale of The Spectator? Well, it's a good question. The way I see this is we've ended, um, this is the finale of series two of our drama, and we're going to go into the first episode of series three. Who will get to sell us? I don't know. Will it be the Emirates? Will it be the independent directors? We'll find out. How will that sale take place? Previously, we had quite a transparent process being organised by Lloyds Bank, and we had 22 bidders for The Telegraph and The Spectator, and some of the, the finest names in British and European publishing are really encouraging list. I remember looking at that list thinking I'd be delighted with any 10 of these bidders. So I would like it to go back to that process and it can resume. We don't need a penny of anybody else's money. The Spectator is doing 
pretty well. We don't need a sugar daddy. We don't need a shake. We just need the ability to invest more of our readers' money in our journalism. And any number of owners in democracies could do that. Which one will end up with? I don't know. Will we ever say in that? I'm not sure we will. And might I wake up one morning and be told by Abu Dhabi that our new owner is Joe Bloggs? Perhaps. I just hope Joe Bloggs looks after us. Fraser, this isn't a very free market line coming from you, which will surprise a lot of people. And some of your critics have said that there is a bit of a hypocrisy here. Um, how can you take such a liberal line when it comes to foreign investment more generally, having that outward look, wanting to get money into the UK, but then decide that the red line for you is going to be when it relates to your magazine? It is personal to me, you're right to say that. But what's personal to me is the notion of press freedom, which I think the only definition of press freedom is freedom from government. This isn't about foreigners. Foreign owners have been investing in British papers for, for centuries, pretty much. Um, but any ownership whether of government, whether it's the Swedish government, the British government, or the Emirati government, crosses the line. So to be very clear, your issue's not with foreign ownership. It's with the word government. Yes, it is, yes. But when government partly owns a paper, that paper ceases to be able to call itself free press. I think Twitter, weirdly, has got quite a good definition. Um, they will say if a, a media outfit is state-owned or part-state-owned. I think both of those labels are um, necessary. But you're the kind of editor and you oversee a kind of publication that often criticizes when we try to get state money, state investment into a lot of these businesses or private companies. We look for investment abroad. We look for investment from other people. Why should The Spectator be any different? I think you need to distinguish between investments into, I don't know, a shopping center. There's no problem in there. An investment which can compromise you either for democratic apparatus or for um, free speech purposes. So I think there are lines to be drawn. Now, if you look around the world, you can see that since the autocracy started to buy up democratic apparatus about after the crash, there was a big sort of gate was open then when people thought, you know, we're so indebted, we're going to have to take Chinese money, and get Huawei in to do a 5G network. They'll do it nice and cheap. So, and then only now are people beginning to think, hang on, there are national security implications to this. So where do we draw the line? I think this week was the first time that the British Parliament woke up and thought, let's see where we can draw the line. I guess I'm just trying to tease out the personal from the political and the policy because you make interesting points about Huawei, certainly Hinckley Point in terms of the investment that we've seen there, but there hasn't been such an active campaign from The Spectator's editor stop those projects. When we first heard that the Emirates were going to bid for the Spectator, it took me a while to work out, hang on, is this really the Emirates government? Because Redbird said it wasn't. And um, could there be editorial boards? Is this um, compatible with press freedom? And it took me a long, long time to work out the exact dynamics of this because the bid came out of the blue. Only since then have I been looking back and joining the dots and seeing this as part of a pattern of trying to influence the apparatus of democracies. So perhaps because I've been at the sharp end of this and I've seen, I've looked under the hood and I've seen the network of influence, how easy it's been for governments to, to buy up various officials like George Osborne and to, I've spoken to government members who will say to me, Fraser, we understand, but look, face it, we need the money from these guys so we can't be too um, harsh on them. And it's conversations like that that we wouldn't normally have had, but I did have because of this, that made me realise how compromised even people who believe in a free press and government are because they think they need to balance this with the need to get in investment for infrastructure. So I've been given a ringside seat, I suppose, in the inner bowels of what it's like when autocracies try to buy democratic um, institutions. And I have not liked one little bit what I've seen.